Hi, y'all. I'm Atticus, a bookseller at Literati Bookstore and the host for tonight's event. This evening, we are pleased to welcome Lynn Stein at our At Home with Literati series in support of Shaking the Shackles, Women's Empowerment Through Craft. For our attendees, the chat is closed, but I'll be dropping links to purchase Shaking the Shackles from Literati throughout the event. You can also use the Q&A feature on your toolbar to submit any questions at any time, and I'll take a selection of them at the end uh, and ask them to Lynn. A reminder that you can shop for more books at literatibookstore.com uh, for curbside pickup and ship to your home as well as in store. And now allow me to introduce tonight's author. Lynn Stein is a textile artist trained as an exhibition and display designer, as well as an art therapist. Lynn's work has been featured in magazines and journals as well as on BBC radio. She has taught extensively in a variety of community, educational and healthcare settings, as well as within museums and galleries. So without further ado, I'll tune it over to you. Hi, good, good evening. Um, well, evening here and afternoon for you. Um, thank you very much for inviting me, Literati, and uh, it's nice to talk to everybody. So, of course, I'm here to talk about my new book, which is Shedding the Shackles, Women's Empowerment Through Craft, which is published by Bloomsbury. Um, it's actually publication day in the US today, but it was published in the UK where I live um, two months ago, actually. So Shedding the Shackles very much is concerned with the links between women's creativity and their empowerment. And it tells the stories um, amongst um, talking about individual artists and their craft practices, which actually address different issues of um, female empowerment. But it also talks about social enterprises and um, age old matriarchal techniques, really, which are used and in some cases redeveloped and contemporized and actually impact in a positive sense in, in various ways, impact upon, upon the women involved and then ultimately upon their communities as well. But I thought I'd first um, tell you a bit more about my own creative practice, um, visually creative, um, and because I'm actually doing this from my studio uh, and I'm surrounded really, you can only see a fraction of it, but I'm surrounded by uh, an overflowing bookshelf. Um, some of my work that's up on the wall behind me um, and kind of different artifacts. Um, but I thought I'd kind of tell you a little bit about my work also to kind of give context to the motivation for writing the book really. So a lot of my work is, uh, I suppose, influenced by folk art and mythology and children's drawings and tales and legends. And largely I work using, yeah, as I've said, I'm, I'm basically a textile artist. So a lot of the work is using felt making techniques. You can sort of see a bit of it here really. And also rag rug techniques, which I know have a long tradition and history also in the US as well as in the US and Canada, as well as in the UK, and actually are very much more pictorial where you are historically than where we are. Um, so, so with my rag rug pieces, um, I will use burlap, um, which we call hessian, actually, as a foundation cloth. And I use tools like this, which is probably very similar to what you would use over in the States. So hook, a prodder and a hook um, and different recycled fabrics and yarns, very often recycled, not, not wholly, but to create work like That's a sort of small sample of a piece of work um, of mine. 
Um, and you can see that I very much enjoy using color and I'm very interested in kind of textile behaviors. And um, when I'm describing my work, I'm often talking about them as uh, and describing them as textile mosaics um, because it's that sort of juxtaposition of units of color and texture to kind of form a whole. So using these methods, I've worked and taught lots and lots of groups of people. Um, a lot of my residences and commissions um, have been undertaken in um, healthcare situations and education. And a lot of my commissions have been for public, private and domestic spaces. Um, so libraries and public, public buildings, um, as well as hospitals and healthcare spaces. So talking about kind of the folklore and mythology aspects, and as I said, I also um, use felt making processes. So a lot of the work is actually slow, slow processes, but I also use um, electrical, electronic methods as well. So I have like an embellishing machine, which is an electronic, and I also use an electric tufting gun. So in the studio, I have a floor to ceiling frame as well. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a powerful tool. So these are just some of the artifacts that I've made. Again, these are sort of very mythologically there's still work to do on this, by the way, um, but they're sort of very driven by folk tales and legends. So these would be the heads for some of the like, entire pieces that you've seen before. So not intentionally beautiful. They're kind of intentionally quite grotesque and androgynous, really. Um, and these are just some of the little elements that go into larger pieces of my work, really. So as well as rug hooks and prodders, I use felting needles and other um, tools and equipment, and a lot of things like beadwork and stitch as well. And so I thought to kind of set the scene a little bit, um, I'd just read you because, because a lot of the contents in the book, admittedly, are, are textiles um, or textiles related. I just wanted to read, to begin with, a little bit of um, a passage from the book, um, which talks about the sort of more contemporary approach to textiles. So. In the first part of the 20th century, suffering from a legacy inherited from the Victorian era, craft skills such as weaving, sewing, embroidery and quilting were regarded largely as women's domestic pastimes and remained undervalued and marginalized. Still associated with a class of stay at home women with leisure time on their hands, it took several decades for attitudes to change for the boundaries between fine art and craft to blur, and for textile crafts to be given the same respect and recognition as other fine art media. In the past, it would be true to say that women's cultural contributions had been largely sidelined and overlooked. However, today, women have achieved a significantly increased visibility within the field of art, craft, design, and the creative industries. The number of museum and gallery directors and curators, and consequently, perhaps the number of exhibitions featuring female artists and craft practitioners has grown and become increasingly embraced and accepted by the art world. With a new fascination in the qualities of fabric and a desire to explore their aesthetic rather than utilitarian potential, the 1960s and 70s revolutionized fiber art sometimes employing boundary pushing media and methods. Since the 1980s, influenced by postmodernist ideas, the medium has found an increasingly conceptual voice. Reaffirming handicraft and needlework as permissible art practice, textile processes 
such as knitting and crochet, started to become employed as both material and subversive feminist tool. So as I say, a lot of my 30 plus years of practice has has been involved working with other people, young and old, and from a variety of different backgrounds and um, with different agenda attached, really. And as I hope is echoed in this book, really, um, it never ceases to surprise me, really, the, the aspects of the healing power of craft and the healing power of women, and I'd like to say men too, really, but um, working together with their hands and um, how that kind of has um, a sort of almost a, an atmosphere of sisterhood very often. And I've witnessed so many times women opening up to each other with kind of more intimate stuff that I think if the handiwork wasn't there additionally, it wouldn't happen so easily. Um, so, so I think there are many, you know, the slow movement, the mindfulness movement, um, mental health issues, craft addresses kind of, or they, they inter, interlink, interweave very well, really. So I thought I'd now go on to sort of just pick some extracts of um, what I hope are relevant readings from the book really to give you some kind of flavor of the book and after that I'd like to just show you and talk you a little bit through some of the objects um, reflected or that actually feature in the book. So I started at the book with a quote from Michelle Obama which I hope actually conveys a lot of or reflects a lot of the contents in the book. The difference between a broken community and a thriving one is the presence of women who are valued. So true. Creativity is at the very core of being human and is the trait that is at the heart of imaginative and innovative thinking and some of civilization's most significant achievements. Albert Einstein talked about the importance of awakening the joy in creative experience. During my practice as a textile artist over the last 30 years, I've continually witnessed in others both the creatively and socially therapeutic power of facilitated creativity. In many of the workshops I've run, it's thanks to that creative buzz involving busy hands and unleashed imaginations and a process I've come to regard as the mindfulness of making that intimate and easy conversations amongst women who were not previously acquainted are so readily enabled. My own practice is somewhat process driven with an interest in the behavior and manipulation of fabric, its construction and transformation, and often utilizing reclaimed and recycled, repurposed fabrics, threads, objects, and artifacts. Much of the work included in this book is partially a reflection of my long held interest in folk art and admittedly my ability to be constantly seduced by color, pattern and texture. But in every case, they also exemplify my interest in the skills and in the making methods and the artisans and indeed the stories behind the work. Much of it requires outstanding patience and attention to detail and a respect for traditions and methods which have been preserved for generations, often within strong feminocentric cultures. With locally available materials and patterns and motifs commonly informed and influenced by fascinating histories, the maker's hands fashion and tell their stories in their chosen medium. Their distinctiveness and handmade charm, usually accompanied by an in intuitive sense of color and form, frequently make the pieces irresistible.
It is true that the book features predominantly textile related crafts, but in so many parts of the world, in their tactility and as a means of communication and expression, textile crafts represent the skills and traditions which particularly in matrilineal societies have been passed from generation to generation and woven into their culture. For many of the female enterprises featured, handicraft represents their very means of survival. Within this context, the term empowerment may take on different connotations and definitions, dependent upon the culture, cosmology, history, topography, political and social circumstances surrounding any particular group of women. It's too easy to have both an idealized romantic notion of the issues and also to view situations with Western value systems. For some groups of women, it represents support, companionship, social cohesion, information sharing, perhaps even addressing issues of homelessness or displacement, or the means to escape, at least for a portion of the day, from an oppressive, male-dominated environment. In the recounting and stitching of their stories, for some it offers the flexibility of being able to combine their traditional craft skills with domestic duties and childcare, whilst being able for the first time in their lives to open a bank account and supplement the family income. For others, it offers the first opportunity of gaining continued employment and the freedom from long-held stigma, as is the case in certain Ethiopian com communities where mothers of twins can be tragically outcast from society. Numerous studies and statistics illustrate that by creating economic empowerment, particularly in rural communities, whereby women are able to generate a regular and sustainable source of income, the poverty cycle can effectively be inhibited, ultimately creating a degree of social change. In their ability to be both practical and adaptable, women have consistently proven that they are more able to make family-focused decisions. They create secure households, purchase livestock, grow fruit and vegetables, providing adequate nutrition, hygiene, healthcare, access to clean water, and educational provision for their daughters as well as their sons. All of this in turn has a positive impact upon their communities. So, are shackles actually being shed? And if so, to what degree? Quite apart from my sheer admiration of the contents of their creative output, I've continually asked myself just these questions whilst engaging with and seeking answers from the many hugely helpful contributors in this book. Among several cultures and societies, in addition to their various domestic tasks, the actual workload for women increases considerably when adding the commercial practice of their craft into the mix. However, at grassroots level, perhaps it is social cohesion, the sense of security derived from the ability to independently earn an income, and not least of all, the preservation, protection, and sometimes development of ancient indigenous techniques, which remain key factors. So hopefully that gives you a little sort of summarizing of some of the content and some of the motivation really for researching and writing this book. And as promised, I'd like to show you some of the items that are in the book. And they're not all um, shown in the book, but they come from and are made by the enterprises or regions um, that I've visited that actually feature within the book. So a couple of years ago, um, we visited two islands um, that are off. I'll hold these, hold these items up for starters and then I'll show you a bit more sing singly. Um, two islands which are an hour from 
um, the mainland of Estonia. And both islands, because, um, because of they're a seafaring community, the men are away at sea or on building projects for great long periods of time. So historically and currently today, they are very strongly matriarchal societies, which is to say that the, the females lead the society, they're the leaders of the society, they make all the important decisions. And um, as well as the decision making, the textiles there, as well as having UNESCO heritage, um, they, the textile making is very important and has continued, and it's important that it does continue for generations and, and generations beyond this. So the little piece of weaving I'm showing you, and this is just a small pin cushion, the piece of weaving, um, it's the wool is quite coarse and it's um, spun from their locally bred sheep. But the pattern, the stripe pattern that you see in this is the typical stripe pattern of the weave within the female skirts. And any adult woman there would probably possess within her wardrobe around 17 skirts. But there are different configurations of the colors of stripes in these skirts. Um, and those different configurations really will communicate to the rest of the community, the society, um, that woman's status and also her circumstances really. So if there's a profusion, for instance, of very dark colors and predominantly blacks, one would know that that woman is in a state of mourning or certainly in difficult, dire circumstances really. And conversely, if there are many bright colors and a lot of these sort of lime greens, and bright pinks and reds, um, that would denote joy and youth and perhaps marriage or childbirth. So a sort of more, more happy, joyous time really. So I think it's really interesting that the weave of the skirts or the court as it's known can communicate all of that really. And in their typical dress, you would see different floral patterns worn and it's all married women wear, wear a headscarf and an apron. Um, and the blouses are made of similar fabrics. So they would have a profusion of this mixture of, of fabrics. And actually you'll be pleased to know that these fabrics are actually imported there from the US. And just, you know, a neighboring island, Muhu, which has also a very rich textile tradition and fantastic knitwear. So this would be typical Muhu motifs in the knitwear. And they're very, very bright, vibrant colors, which today, whereas they would have relied on sort of natural dye stuffs, today they do use chemical and aniline dyes. So the sort of bright pinks and the oranges alongside one another are very common to the Muhu tradition of knitting. So well worth a visit, I would say. And I thought I would next show you some of the work by Monkey Biz. These charming animals. And I think probably by now, well, I, I know that they are seen and known and collected throughout the world now. Um, it was started in 2000 by um, the, the enterprise as a non-profit enterprise by two ceramicists and art collectors, um, Shirley Fintz and um, the other name escapes me just right now, and also um, a local bead worker and her mother. So they are fabulous. And I think that, you know, you see a lot of beadwork, traditional beadwork in South Africa. Um, and I sort of call these, not disparagingly, but a piece like this is more the sort of thing that you would find on the streets to buy really. But you can see the great difference really between that and these pieces and the complexity. And 
the profusion of motifs. So the women beaders are given the wire for the legs, the, um, the beads, of course, the, um, the stuffing, the wadding and the cotton fabrics. Um, and they are paid, it's paid into their accounts as soon as they finish an article. Um, a number of their bead, a number of their bead workers are now really quite famous and produce very collectible work. Um, there's Joyce Sitoli, whose work is very known, and Zisiwe Lunquana. Um, so Joyce Sitoli's work is very flamboyant, and unfortunately I don't have one to show you here, but in the book you will see several examples of their work. And they're very savvy in terms of the marketability of these pieces. They've, they've learned really that um, you know, the, work, the pieces with sort of um, more wacky facial characteristics um, often reach, you know, fetch the higher prices. In 2015, they did an amazing collaboration with the Haas brothers, um, a design duo, brother duo, um, based in LA. And they created a body of work called Afriques, um, and with the bead, with the traditional, well, their traditional bead work, um, and I should emphasize that really they are encouraged, their imagination, each beader's imagination is, is encouraged to sort of um, creatively explore the possibilities with the pieces they make. But with the Afrique's collection, they also combined other materials um, like copper and wood and felt and rubber. Um, so these have been shown at uh, various design um, design shows, important world design shows, um, Indaba Expo and um, the um, Basel Miami Expo as well. And so these are now really sought sought after pieces. Um, you know, all over the world, really, um, by certainly by collectors and curators and interior designers, architects, um, etc. So it, it's, um, it's proven to be a highly successful initiative. If you've seen the book at all, the, well, you saw it at the beginning of this presentation, of course, but so this will probably be quite recognizable to you. So this is Madhubani Papier-Mâché, which is made in um, Madhubani in the state of Bihar, which is in Northern India, up near Nepal. Um, I'll just show you kind of, so you get an idea of the chunkiness and how it's made. Um, and really they, they have been influenced by the kind of several centuries ago by the mud creations in the area that were traditionally made for rituals and ceremonies, wedding ceremonies. <clears throat> but the imagery is also influenced by the local Madhubani painting, which has been a tradition for several hundred years um, and painted by very skilled women. So in fact, women who are now coming into working with papier-mâché, working with this Madhubani papier-mâché, it's been very possible to transfer their skills because um, the painted imagery is very similar. And just to show you the methods of the painting, that would be the start of the painting. But of course, the actual structure is um, it's very important, that sort of rough hand molded look of it, but it's a lengthy procedure. Um, it starts with sort of pulped paper um, being soaked for hours and hours, and then there's lots of sanding. And interestingly, um, to the mix, um, which obviously has a, a resin um, mixed with it, but they also use fenugreek in the mix to give it a sort of... Um, 
nice, I suppose, scent, but it's also a deterrent to the insects um, as well, which is pretty important in the climate that they live in. So yeah, a very lengthy process until they actually get to the painting part. So these black lines are known as kachni, and it would always start with those. And they, um, they would do the outlines first, always in, in the black. And the, the motifs, the elements within these, as well as the sort of more geometric motifs, there'd be a lot of sort of mythological and flora and fauna. And then they would be painted in such a manner with usually bright colors and then a transparent varnish. And one of my prided possessions is this piece. So those kind of larger than life eyes really, and the sort of hand molded process is, is very typical of Madhubani painting and then of the Madhubani papier-mâché painting as well. So I think it's really lovely. I, I love the fact that it is so very clearly hand done. But one of the interesting things is that um, about 10 years ago, they actually formed a papier-mâché cluster and looked at ways of regenerating the craft and making it more accessible and marketable, really. And as well as that handcrafted look, they've, they've looked at ways and have implemented ways of making the process um, quicker by using plaster of Paris molds and stainless steel molds, but always, again, sort of adding this, this very hand sculpted finished look. And this piece, it's just a small piece, and I do have like a rather big picture of the work, but this is Karos in South Africa. And this enterprise was started by an artist who with her husband <clears throat> decided to move from Johannesburg in South Africa, and they became citrus farmers um, in the Limpopo province. And she was very concerned about the seasonal um, seasonal impact of, of farming um, and the nature of that sort of, that it would impact upon people's livelihoods, really. There would be no income, you know, in the um, more arid season. So knowing that um, in the area, beadwork is, you know, has been a traditional craft, beadwork, sorry, embroidery has been a traditional craft um, amongst, amongst the Shangan women, um, she, she set up this enterprise and they now make uh, a variety of items. And in fact, they won the South African, um, it's a very prestigious craft award. And I think it's no wonder actually, when I look at the work and hopefully when you look at the work in the book, you can see why actually Karos is one of the most successful, um, successful export industries in South Africa. So the work is beautiful. The, the motifs are usually, there's a contrast between that sort of small running stitch and the chain stitch, which maybe if I hold it a little closer, you might be able to see. Um, the chain stitch within, which, which fills the shapes in. And then these scallops at the bottom very often feature in borders of the work, in borders of the bigger pictures. Um, and they actually echo the scallop shapes that often um, decorate painted, their painted houses. So the Shangam women are very, very, very house proud and very sociable. They very much um, like to share techniques, mentor one another, um, share problems, sit together and do this. And it really does help, you know, with extra income for them. So something that is 
probably more utilitarian and contemporary. I'll hold up two of the bags. So admittedly, not such a craft item and certainly not really traditional either. But these, this is the work of Kite Pride in Tel Aviv in Israel. And this enterprise was, was started by a Swiss couple who became very aware of um, the situation with um, modern slavery, human traffic, human trafficking and prostitution, and felt that they wanted to actually start an enterprise that would give safe rehabilitation to people um, who were suffering from this form of slavery, because it's very well known that it's, it's very difficult to get out of those, those forms of life, um, you know, traumatized and poverty. Um, but yeah, they offer sort of safe rehab employment. And at the same time, they use, they're making um, very functional products and different sorts of bags, which are using um, kite surfing material, windsurfing material, um, wetsuits, parachutes, army, army material, um, all stuff that would have otherwise gone to landfill, really. So they're making usable items from this. And there are 16 um, global um, drop-off points um, yeah, around the world for all this material. So it truly is an initiative which has kind of turned trash into treasure, really. And I do know that actually a couple of these um, people working for Kite Pride have actually gone on to become quite eminent designers. And hey there, then, Lynn. Hi. So I, we, <laughs> no, I don't mean to, to jump in no, too. No, no, I'm probably over time. <laughs> no, you're rocking it. This is so incredible. Um, <laughs> just wanted to ask a few questions before we kind of shut it down. Sure. Um, Go ahead. And I uh, wanted to jump back to some stuff you said at the beginning. Um, you had mentioned that you have been practicing for 30 years and that over that time, the uh, the agendas have changed based on your, your circumstances. Um, just curious how, this is a kind of a bit of a two-part question. Right. <laughs> how your work evolves and changes based on the setting so whether it's in a healthcare setting or if it's in a museum or if you're teaching young people. Right. That's, for, yeah. Yeah, that's a very good question. Well, you know, it depends because if I've been commissioned to do a piece of work, sometimes I've been given absolutely free reign based on the kind of work that they are, you know, the commissioner is already familiar with, but if I'm, say, doing an art week or a residency with a school, it would very much depend on what we call here key stages. I don't know whether you have the same, whether that's elementary or high school or obviously what age group. So in elementary school, I would have tried as far as possible to make um, to make the work address cross-curricular themes. So we could be also looking at say stories, um, you know, for, for English and tessellation in maths. Um, yeah, looking at, you know, various different subjects really to, to include in the work. Sometimes it's very process driven. So at the other end of the scale, if I'm maybe teaching university, you know, art school, um, students or, or what we have as A-level, so that's just prior to going to, to university, um, it's probably rather more process driven because that would be part of their curriculum. Um, in a healthcare situation, it really depends on the group that I'm working with. So I did have a long-term residency at one uh, time with people who had been traumatized and had been in accidents. So of course, a lot of the 
uh, sort of accessibility and you know is is really an issue some people were in wheelchairs and um you know so so those also become very prime considerations and so it's kind of i think i'm always looking at sort of process and product because sometimes the process can become more important than the final product i mean my first my first few commissions actually were for public art spaces and they actually were about recording the history of places so i live just outside manchester and it was the centenary of manchester ship canal and so i had to research the whole history of the making of manchester ship canal in consultation also with other groups of people but i part of my residency and commission was to actually engage and work with lots of groups of people, um, teaching them the techniques, but also consulting them about the history and about local knowledge, really. Um, so it does differ hugely, really, not always dependent upon the environment, but um, I guess also the nature of the commission, really. Um, and I must say, I've also, this is a long answer, really, but I've also done certain residences that um, where I've actually asked um, celebrities for celebrity cast off because a lot of my work involves recycling. So celebrity cast off materials. And yeah, there's a lot of people who've been like incredibly generous with um, great stuff really. And it's been very, you know, that's engaged the people who are working on the piece with me like, oh my goodness, that's Joanna Lumley's shirt or whatever. <laughs> So that, that actually goes to another little question, which is you had talked about this kind of political versus aesthetic side of your work. Um, and when you are uh, talking about environment, uh, so much of art is contextual based on what's going on in the world. And when, when you're working process more than outcome, how are you balancing the kind of political atmosphere of the world and the aesthetic side, as well as just delving into the process of it? Right. I probably should. I mean, I think I would say also researching and writing this book, of course, has kind of also increased my political awareness and also the reasons why people are doing what they're doing. But in more contemporary terms, um, I think I have to sort of admit that, um, you know, my, my own practice is a lot driven by my kind of investigation of materials and inventive recycling. I mean, I'm very concerned with sort of recycling, reuse, but also in a very aesthetic sense, because it's, it is like converting trash into treasure. It's like, you know, how can you make beautiful what, what otherwise might have been just discarded and thrown away? It's kind of a challenge. Um, it's an interesting question looking at the climate crisis as well right now. How, uh, how is this thing that is utterly destructive and, and yes. will soon kind of be this neglected garbage heap of ours how exactly. do we how do we recycle that how do we change that how do we make it beautiful again absolutely which is why you know i also do think you know like the kite pride initiative with the the bags that's that's so great to think you know that all this stuff that would have gone to landfill is actually made and sold as useful bags yeah well thank you so much lynn thank you for taking the time to talk with us um pleasure really nice to meet you <laughs> yeah very good to meet you too well so we've reached the end we're getting close to the top of the hour and just wanted to thank lynn and thank all of you for joining us uh at our at home with literati events um thanks to our viewers as well make sure to buy the book uh i'll drop the link in the chat right now uh just before we hop off and uh then i'll say take care to all of you Okie dokie, let me drop this link real quick.
Alrighty. Sticking in there right now. Okay. Alrighty. Thank you so much, Lynn. Thank you very much. Bye, Atticus. Bye. Bye.